Well, good afternoon and thanks for joining us again today for the Daily Update. My name is Dougald Saunders, joined today by the Chief Executive of the Western New South Wales Local Health District, Scott McLaughlin, and also Acting Chief Superintendent David Horseman, who's here today from New South Wales Ambulance, to tell us a bit about uh, the role that Ambulance is playing in this whole COVID uh, preparation and reaction to COVID-19. I want to talk firstly today about some vaccination rates. We'll get to the numbers in just a moment and Scott will talk a bit more about the vax rates as well, but I just thought it was good to start off with something a bit more positive today. So looking at, uh, our, I guess, our three largest council areas in the Health District, Dubbo Regional Council sitting currently at 84.2% first dose, 36.7% second dose. Bathurst Regional Council, 76.1% first dose, 39.2% second dose. And Orange at 85.7% first dose and 47.3% second dose. Now these are figures uh, particularly from the New South Wales Department of Health. Uh, the biggest movers in a couple of our smaller council areas are Gilgandra and Narromine. So Gil is up 54.6% since August to now have a rate of 77.1% first dose and 42.9% second, and Narromine up 50.7% since August, now at 81% first dose and 30% second dose. Vaccination, one of our keys on a pathway out of COVID. Up until eight o'clock last night, 14 new cases have been reported for the Western New South Wales Local Health District. Uh, Dubbo local government area has 11 of those, two are at Wellington. So Dubbo itself has nine, Wellington has two, 11 for the Dubbo LGA. And Walgett recording three, two at Walgett, one at Lightning Ridge, although that Lightning Ridge case, Scott will talk a bit more, looks like it will come off the cases, but Scott will talk a bit more to that in just a moment. The health district total now at 992, cumulative, Dubbo at 718. The Far West has five new cases, four at Wilcannia and one for Broken Hill. In our COVID Care in the Community program, there are currently 393 people being looked after. That's been a really successful program. 57 extra people have been discharged from that uh, in the last 24 hours, so meaning they no longer require care or are infectious. And that number is now over 500 that have been through that program and out the other end and, uh, and recovered. From the 14 new cases today, at least three have been infectious in the community for more than two days. One of those in Dubbo, two in Walgett. Two have been definitely isolating and nine are still being investigated. And again, Scott will talk a bit more about some of those other linkages and also uh, some sewage detection as well. Another little change to mention today, we've had uh, a couple of changes recently around learner drivers, around the five people gathering. Today it's around libraries. So up until this point, libraries in stay-at-home areas have been closed, but there is a new exemption now to allow libraries to be open for click and collect. So councils will be looking uh, at how to make that work at their local level. Uh, so talk to your local council about the opportunities coming up, but libraries will able to be open uh, for click and collect from here on in. Testing across the region, uh, around 2,400. Um, on testing, I just want to mention, and we've popped this up on Facebook this morning, the test and isolate payment of $320 is now available across the region. Uh, up until this point, it's only been in the local government areas of concern, the 12 local government areas in Sydney, which are regarded as hotspots, None of our area is regarded as a hotspot, but as of today, from September 9, in fact, the test and isolate payment is available right across our region, right across New South Wales. So that's great news, and, and this is to encourage you to test early. If you have any symptoms at all, get tested and isolate. If you don't receive any other benefits, any other payments like sick leave or COVID leave in some cases that some companies have, you may be able to claim the $320. On the Facebook post, there is a link to all of that information, but we're encouraging you to use uh, that uh, to, to help uh, promote the fact that you can, you can receive payment if you're doing it tough and you haven't been able to get any leave while you're isolating in, in other times. From now, you definitely can and hopefully that payment will take a bit of pressure off for some people who have been finding it difficult. 
Uh, on testing, there are clinics, of course, open right across the region. Scott will talk a bit more in detail about that, but Walgut's an important one at the swimming pool again today. Uh, the new heavy vehicle testing station working well just at the Black Butt Road rest area, and that's running essentially 24-7. It is staffed uh, between 6am and 9pm, and then telehealth with a security guard on site after that. So there's, there's always the availability of testing there, and it's adding another uh, real boost to the testing capability in the region. Vaccination, those figures were great, weren't they? And, and I guess part of today is about encouraging you to make sure you are taking up the opportunity for not just first, but also second doses. So in Dubbo today, the ADF clinic again, running second dose clinics out of the Dubbo Regional Theatre and Convention Centre. Uh, the feedback has been that there have been a few people missing appointments. If you are given a text message and asked to turn up, it, normally it's an hour time frame, you're, you're required to be there. Please make the very most of that and come and get your second dose. If there's a particular reason you can't, please respond to that text message and ask for a different appointment day. Now, if you haven't received a text, we've talked about this before, but if you haven't received a text and you did get your first dose at the ADF pop-up clinic some three weeks ago, just go on the corresponding day. So if you went on the first Tuesday of the clinic last time, go today and go roughly at the same time you went on that day. If you need any more help, you can, you can contact that 1300 066 055 public health line. But we're, we're really asking you to, to make sure you're coming forward and getting that second dose while this clinic is back in town again. Uh, so it's running in Dubbo today for the next six days, in Parks today as well for second doses. So that's starting and running for three days at Parks. So again, if you had your first dose at Parks, from today, those second dose appointments are happening as well. There's a link on this uh, Facebook post as well to list all of the towns and when those second doses will be back in your area over the coming week or so. Do remember to take some ID. A couple of forms of ID is really helpful. Your Medicare card if you have one or your individual health identification number if you don't have Medicare. Now the Wellington Vaccination Clinic also doing second doses. Started yesterday, uh, did uh, around about 100 or so second doses yesterday, 170 booked in for today. It's been a really great success story, so well done. AstraZeneca is still happening at WAX and also at the Swift Street Medical Facility. So if you're keen for AstraZeneca, you can still book in with those appointments uh, if you're uh, needing to get your first dose, particularly at Wellington. And look, around booking vaccinations, there are still so many opportunities. And again, I've been speaking to GP clinics around the region. Many of them, if not most, are taking people that aren't regular clients of that GP facility. So you can do a bit of a ring around, find an appointment. There are appointments available in many cases within the next week for first doses. So please take up that opportunity. And particularly if you've got children in that 12 to 16 year old age bracket that haven't had the eligibility up until now, uh, GPs have been doing them for a few weeks. We're really encouraging you to reach out to your GP clinics. And of course, all the other ways of getting a vaccine as well, including your local pharmacy where you get your flu shot. So get active, get vaccinated, and let's see those numbers continue to rise. I'll hand over to Scott now for his health update. Oh, thanks, Dougal, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, well, some positive news that uh, we've now seen the biggest increase in Western New South Wales across the whole, compared to the whole of the state in uh, vaccination rates, and particularly for people receiving their first dose, and particularly across our Aboriginal community. Uh, nearly 30% of our population in Western New South Wales has seen significant increases in, uh, in vaccination rates. And so thank you to everyone that's come forward in the last month in particular that's uh, changed uh, life outcomes for people getting protected from, from COVID. So to talk about a couple of those in particular, our first dose rates for Aboriginal community across the region have gone from 17% up to 56%, um, a huge increase. Now for non-Aboriginal people, that's gone from 41 up to 82%. So a doubling in uh, non-Aboriginal people, but nearly a tripling uh, for Aboriginal community. Um, importantly, uh, the second dose rates for both Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal um, community across the whole of Western New South Wales are now the same at 38% uh, across the whole of the region. Now, um, seven of our local government areas have now got uh, first dose vaccination rates above 80%. And so thank you to everyone in uh, Weddon, Orange, Dubbo, Canamble, Parks, Narromine and Midwestern local government areas. That's an amazing outcome to see 80% of people or more with, uh, with a first dose um, in their arms. In terms of second dose, uh, Canamble is uh, the leader in having more than 50% of uh, people 
uh, with uh, second dose, uh, nine LGAs uh, between 40 and 50 per cent, importantly across um, Walgett, Brewarrina and Burke. And so thank you to everyone that's been uh, out to get vaccinated, particularly with second dose in those communities. But as uh, Dougald mentioned, uh, shout out to Gilgandra, the biggest increase across the whole of the region with, uh, with 55 per cent. Now there's still some areas of concern across the whole of the region. A couple of communities including um, uh, Cabon, local government area, Cobar and Oberon. We know that there's GPs and other services that are doing a lot of vaccinating. Um, they're sef definitely being prioritised for the um, Australian Defence Force to visit in, in coming weeks and months. You know, just on the Australian Defence Force um, in the region, uh, they've now extended their time right through until the end of October. And so very positive fuss and a perfect opportunity for us to all get vaccinated in, in Western New South Wales. And so um, the message today is don't hesitate, today's the day to book your vaccine. Whether it's your local GP, your pharmacy, Aboriginal medical service, our vaccination hubs and the drive through here in Dubbo or the forward um, vaccine clinics with the Australian Defence Force. Now we know that the Defence Force in coming weeks are focused on second doses for all of the communities as Dougal um, said those um, bookings will be through uh, the text messages that will come out if you had your first dose through the ADF clinics and please um, look out for those, respond to those but if you haven't uh, got a text message then turn up on the corresponding day when, um, from when you, you had your first dose. So that's some really positive news for us. Um, I do want to see us as the highest vaccinated region in the whole of the country. Um, even with 80% um, of our population with, uh, with two doses, um, that still leaves around 40,000 people that won't have a vaccination in our region at the time when we will see um, COVID circulating more broadly around our region. And so uh, for me, there's some real priorities in that. Um, a lot of our vulnerable people in our communities are our absolute priority to get vaccinated. Um, please, can you think about your mum, your auntie, uncle, um, cousins, um, people that you know in, in our community um, haven't got good health, um, struggle from a, a whole range of reasons to get out and get vaccinated, whether they've got transport disadvantages, other limitations that mean they can't get out of the house. If there's any help and support that you can provide, um, please uh, help them. Um, help everyone in our community to get vaccinated. We've got a window in front of us of the next six weeks that'll be absolutely crucial for us to get everyone vaccinated and protected against uh, the impact of COVID-19. Now, the other critical part of, uh, of our response at the moment is testing. Um, as Dougal said, uh, around 2,400 tests in the last 24 hours. That was slightly up on the day before, but still a hell of a long way be below what we'd uh, like to see. Now, we've taken a step today uh, to expand our testing, particularly in Walgett, to people that haven't got symptoms but ha may have some concerns. And so in Walgett today and in coming days, um, please come out and get tested. Um, even if you haven't got any symptoms, we know that in the last week there's been quite a few infectious people in the community. We know that we haven't identified all of the potential uh, cases in, in Walgett. Now what that also means is that um, people that come and get tested, if you're not symptomatic and don't live with someone or have been in contact with someone closely who's symptomatic, then you don't have to isolate post that, um, that uh, testing. Now that's a big step for us to try and um, have a broader approach to picking up if there is anyone with um, early onset of COVID in the community. Even if you haven't got symptoms, um, you can start to have an infection brewing. And so please, if everyone in Walgett can uh, come out and get tested today, uh, we do have testing available at um, Walgett at the drive-through at the swimming pool uh, from 9.30 to 4 p.m. today and in surrounding communities, both in uh, Lightning Ridge and Canamble. Likewise, please come forward and get uh, tested in those communities. But particularly if you've been in Walgett in the last week, um, we've got a real concern around the number of people that might have been in Walgett either for work or for other family reasons. Uh, we do want to see uh, people come and get tested. Um, please stay in isolation if you've been in close contact with someone that has either um, been diagnosed with COVID or you know that someone's um, had some symptoms over the last week. Now, these are the things that we'll continue to do across the region to um, expand our testing capacity and um, a broad spread approach in coming days, but please um, uh, focus on, on Walgett at the moment. 
So to um, 8 p.m. yesterday for the numbers, uh, we've uh, got 14 cases that have been identified uh, formally, but one of those is being reviewed at the moment. The case that we announced yesterday in Lightning Ridge um, was actually a false positive test. Um, these happen very rarely, but occasionally, and so that uh, case will be um, changed, so it's really 13 today. Uh, so that brings in nine from Dubbo, uh, two from Wellington and two from Walgett. Um, across all of those, um, eight cases out of the 13 are definitely known to be linked. Um, two of those are household contacts and six of them have got definite links to, to other clusters. Um, eight, uh, sorry, six are still under investigation. Uh, we know that two of the 12, sorry, two of those um, in total were definitely infectious in the community and so um, a real concern there, we know that on any day of the week, um, in any supermarket, shopping centre, um, service station or over your back fence, there could be someone that infectious in all of our communities. So please um, take all of the precautions that we know have kept us safe up until now and we'll continue to do that. Um, a couple of the uh, locations or facilities of concern in the aged care facilities in Dubbo continue to see more cases and um, I know a concerning situation for those um, residents, staff and, and family members around those. Uh, so there's now um, uh, 17 confirmed cases in St Mary's Villa that has uh, four additional residents have been diagnosed in the last 24 hours. Um, in Holy Spirit um, there's now 17 cases in total and one staff member in uh, Holy Spirit. Now that'll, I'd expect, continue in coming days. We're doing everything we can to stop the spread in those facilities. There's been a lot of new staff that have been brought in, in the last 24 hours. Um, some infection control expertise that's being brought in, an additional dedicated medical officer in one of those facilities and I guess a lot of support to help keep um, COVID from circulating around those, those environments. Um, it is of a definite concern that we're doing everything we can to, to manage that, that situation. Uh, to the uh, venues of concern, uh, more venues of concern listed um, around Bathurst, Orange, Dubbo and Wellington, uh, please keep your eye on those. They change on a regular basis and will continue to be updated as soon as we've got information from either confirmed cases or other information sources. Um, if you have been in any of those locations, please um, test and isolate until you've got your results and follow the advice that you've been provided in those. Uh, no new sewage detections in the last uh, 24 hours where we don't have active cases at the moment. And we know that that's quite a few locations across the region. Um, testing around uh, 2,400 tests. Um, Across a lot of locations, we did see some increases in the last 24 hours. We'd love to see that double the numbers. Um, we saw around 80 tests undertaken yesterday at Walgut. We definitely want to see with this expanded scope for testing, uh, some further testing in Walgut. In terms of our uh, numbers of patients in hospital, 18 patients in total with um, five now in intensive care, but only two of those five uh, ventilated. Um, across the 18 patients, nine at Dubbo, one at Burke four at Bathurst, three at Orange and one in Narromine. Now all of those um, patients are being cared for by our expert teams. Um, we've seen again more patients discharged from hospital yesterday that was a good outcome of just needing some short term uh, care, care in our acute environments. Um, again a uh, decreasing number in our care in the community program now 393. Um, that's a result of another 57 being discharged yesterday and so some really positive outcomes for all of those people that have been through both their 14 day period of being cared for uh, by our expert clinicians going into the home and all the other supports that are wrapped around them but also some of the patients that are being um, discharged from hospital. Nonetheless some real risk with uh, the vast majority of those patients in hospital are again unvaccinated um, and so that the cause of them being admitted to hospital really could have been um, avoided if they were vaccinated. Around uh, 17 staff in isolation, again a further reduction in the number of staff that are in isolation and more being uh, able to return to the, um, to the workplace. So with that some very positive news on vaccination front please. Everyone um, don't rest on our laurels, this is the time to continue to get um, second doses for everyone that have had, um, had first doses. Um, please look for opportunities around your local community. There's more and more um, GPs coming online with both Pfizer and AstraZeneca. More pharmacies coming online and more pharmacies will come online. 
uh, early next week, I believe, with the Moderna vaccine, which is a very high quality and, uh, and reliable and safe vaccine that will be coming into a lot of pharmacies across our region and particularly prioritised for uh, 12 to 59 year old um, people right through at those age groups uh, at your local pharmacies. So we'll come back with information on that later in the week. So with that, I might hand over to, uh, to David from Ambulance. The Ambulance teams right across our region have just been amazing in providing care in the home for a lot of people, transport and support for people in uh, really critically ill um, situations. Um, our Ambulance officers are just some of the saviours in our local community. So I'll hand over now to David. Thanks, David. Thanks very much, Scott. Uh, just wanted to provide some uh, perspective from New South Wales Ambulance and uh, just a, a few messages that we would really like to, to get across. So it's obviously been a very challenging time for our paramedics and control centre staff, particularly during the lockdown. Uh, we've been busier than ever. Our, across the state, our call takers are, are taking a call every 25 seconds uh, for an ambulance emergency and our paramedics are responding to a, an increase in activity of around about 10% based on uh, last year's figures. So we are busier than ever. Uh, quite often our paramedics don't always know exactly what they're going to. Um, so for that reason we, we treat every case as though they may be COVID positive and they don their full PPE being their, their gowns, their gloves, their uh, goggles and their masks and uh, we, we just want to keep them safe and make sure that they can go home to their families uh, as safe as possible. Um, we had uh, just a few weeks ago a uh, crew attended, uh, they were called to a, a, a residence where there were two COVID positive patients uh, that were quite unwell. And they, when they arrived, they did find two patients that were quite unwell, but there were also 14 other people in the, in the house uh, with varying symptoms that they had. So, uh, as I said, it can be unexpected what the paramedics are, are turning up to. They triage, they, uh, they sorted out what they needed to do with these uh, patients and, and the residents, and they contacted the local health district to uh, bring out some mobile testing uh, to make sure that we were able to either transport or, or leave them in the community. We've been working very closely with Scott and his team uh, across the LHD to make sure we're, we're treating people where they need to be treated. Not everyone needs to go to hospital. Uh, we're increasing our capacity across the state as well in regards to resources. We have just seen 60 new paramedics hit the road in metropolitan areas and all of our recruitment strategies have come forward for the rest of this year as well. Uh, we have, uh, we'll see some benefits from that in the regional areas over coming months. Um, we've also seen a, an increase in our capacity to uh, have retrieval services. Uh, there's been a, a, an RFDS plan on standby here, an additional one uh, for some time now in Dubbo. Um, our paramedics and, and control centre staff are just doing an amazing job out there. Uh, they're exceptional workers in very difficult times. Um, their workplace is very diverse. When the paramedics go out, uh, when they come on shift of a day or a night, um, they don't know what they're going to be called to. Their, uh, their workplace is their station, it's the hospitals, it's the side of the road, it's people's properties, it's people's residences. Uh, it's very diverse in hot and cold weather, um, in rain and all while wearing full PPE. So I just wanted to take this opportunity to thank all of our staff, uh, they're doing an amazing job. Uh, just on the weekend, for example, we're, we're still responding to, to normal everyday uh, emergencies and not everything's COVID related. Uh, we had a, a gentleman in his 50s on Saturday who uh, uh, suffered a cardiac arrest as he was driving along and, and crashed into a, uh, uh, a wall. Bystanders at the time were amazing. They uh, sprung to action. They extricated the patient from the vehicle. Uh, they commenced really effective CPR and some very quick thinkers were able to uh, source a defibrillator to, uh, to give this uh, gentleman some shocks as well, which essentially saved his life. Our paramedics arrived, they, they continued on the treatment, delivering further shocks, uh, transported this patient to hospital with a pulse and was breathing. They later transferred the patient to Orange Hospital uh, and the patient was sitting up talking to us. So that's the reason why we do the job we do. Uh, we love to help the community um, but uh, at the same time, uh, the community can help our paramedics as well. So the two real strong messages I wanted to get across today is that uh, save triple zero for emergencies. If you have other options such as GP, uh, pharmacies, uh, Health Direct, 
please use those uh, as you can. But if it's a medical emergency, please dial triple zero. And the other strong message, of course, is to get vaccinated. Thank you. Thanks, David. We will take some questions now straight away. Does anyone have a question for David? We have one from Riley from the Central Western Daily. Hey there. Um, just a quick one. I just wanted to check those um, two um, examples you gave, the one with the 16 people in the house and also the, um, the crash you just mentioned, were those both Dubbo or were those um, anywhere else, any other LGOs? Oh, they were both in Dubbo. Cool. Cheers for that. That's all for me. Thanks, Riley. Taylor from the Daily Liberal. Hi, David. I was just wondering, um, how can you decide whether it's appropriate as a COVID patient to call the ambulance or not? How do they decide whether it's appropriate to do so? So a lot of the patients who are COVID positive in the community are being treated in the community by uh, the COVID in the community specialist team. And uh, it's usually them that are calling us uh, rather than the patient themselves. So uh, the people who are COVID positive are getting checked on quite regularly. So uh, we're usually called upon to transport them when they're becoming quite ill. Thanks, Taylor. Gary from the ABC. Hi, thank you. Um, I just wanted to get a bit of an idea about um, vaccination rates for paramedics and ambulance services. Is there a requirement for them to be vaccinated? And can, do you have a bit of an idea about how many are vaccinated? Yeah, so uh, we have a requirement under the public health order now as frontline health workers to have our first dose vaccination by the 30th of September and our second dose by the, the 30th of November. So we're certainly aiming towards that. Uh, I don't have the figures in front of me as to what across the state. Uh, I know that uh, we're, we're uh, monitoring very closely our numbers and uh, we're, I know that I've got uh, double vaccination and the majority of my colleagues do as well. Thanks, Gary. If anyone else has any questions for David, could you please raise your hands now? It appears the answer is no. Thank you very much. We'll, uh, we'll bring Dougal forward. If anyone has any questions for Dougal, could you please raise your little digital hands now? One from Riley from the Central Western Daily. Hey there. Um, yeah, so it's just about the test and isolate uh, payments. Yep. So I just had a look on the, yeah, the website around eligibility for it. Um, so it says you're not eligible for the payments if you've been directed by New South Wales Health to test and isolate as you're a close contact of a known case. Can I just get the reason for that? Are they receiving other payments because of that or what's the reason they aren't getting paid for that? Uh, look, I'll have to check on that one, Riley. In most cases, this is about a payment that you receive if you're not eligible for anything else. Um, so, you know, in many cases, people that are isolating uh, have sick leave or some have pandemic leave. I'm not sure about that specific. I haven't seen that specific detail in, in that document. Um, I mean, I did check on the eligibility, but mostly it's around uh, people that fall into a crack where there is no other way of getting a payment. So if you're self-employed, for example, and, um, uh, you, you know, you're needing to isolate for a couple of days, it's about you know trying to make sure you're not uh, you're not losing out. Now, a lot of people have asked about well, why couldn't it be backdated? Uh, why is it only starting now? Uh, look, there's been a lot of talk about how we need to raise testing rates for one. Up and up until this point, uh, that payment has been available in the 12 hotspot LGAs, as I mentioned earlier on. We are not one of those, uh, but from today and backdated till the 9th it will be for the entire state. So it's about encouraging people. We realise that sometimes that, that test and isolate is a real inconvenience and can be a financial burden. So it's about recognising that and trying to fill in some of those gaps that have been occurring. Okay, cheers. Thanks, Riley. Taylor from The Daily Liberal. Hi, Dougal. Sorry, I think this might be a better question for Scott, but I was just wondering, it was being anticipated that we would um, peak this week and it's obviously not looking like that. Um, is it possible that we've already peaked and we will see numbers go down or are we still kind of anticipating um, an influx of cases to go up again at some point? Yeah, look, Scott will no doubt talk to that as well, Taylor, but I think, uh, you know, yesterday, 
I think I used the, the phrase cautiously optimistic and numerous times throughout the day and that still remains the case. We know, for example, Walgett is um, really causing a bit of worry for, for health officials um, and just the testing numbers. We know the testing numbers need to be more to get a genuine reflection of where COVID might be in the community. So look, we've probably um, hit, hit a couple of high points in the last week or two. Uh, and the expectation is that that could still be something that happens, but it depends on how many people are getting tested. Um, Scott can talk a bit more about health expectations around that, but really if we don't have more people being tested, then maybe those numbers will remain low. Thanks, Taylor. It appears that is everyone doing good. Thank you very much. Thank you. We will quickly bring Scott forward. And we will run through questions as usual. Taylor, did you have a question for Scott there? No, sorry, I don't know if I accidentally raised my hand. <laughs> no, no stress. Uh, Gary from ABC Western Plains. Yeah, thanks, Matt. Hi, hi, Scott. Um, I just wanted to ask you, the Australian Medi the Aboriginal Health and Medical Research Council yesterday told a parliamentary inquiry into state government's response to COVID-19 that the second dose of, for Indigenous people is far lower for Indigenous people than it is for non-Aboriginal people and they're really struggling to bring Aboriginal people back to get those second doses. What sort of efforts are being done by the LHD and New South Wales Health in general to, I guess, ensure that Aboriginal people are getting that second dose? Mm, sure, Gary. Thanks, mate. Um, so uh, to, just to correct uh, the information I provided before, um, uh, rate for second dose for Aboriginal community is actually 22% uh, compared to 41% for non-Indigenous community. So uh, close to half of the rate. And so um, we know that with the, um, the programs across the whole of the region, the Aboriginal medical services, the GPs, the Australian Defence Force that have been out vaccinating in the last month, um, a lot of Aboriginal community have seen their first dose. The most crucial thing now is to make sure that um, you've got a plan for your second dose. So uh, in a lot of the region, um, our Aboriginal medical services and, and other services are providing a lot of support to people that need transport or need help getting to the second dose. Um, a lot of those are being called in advance and um, and booked and so that there is a lot of focus around uh, the second dose um, for people. As we've been talking about with the Australian Defence Force um, clinics, there's been a lot of Aboriginal people uh, vaccinated across the region with those clinics. They will be returning to all of our communities in coming weeks and so if everyone can keep their eye out for that. If you attended for the first dose then please um, come back for the second dose. You should receive that um, SMS, SMS message. Um, if you don't receive it for you know, one reason or another, a wrong phone number or something like that, then please turn up on the day corresponding to when you came previously. Now, um, a lot of our services are providing the support for people to get to those, book in for the second dose and find alternatives if you haven't got that booked in. So can I can encourage everyone, don't just think that uh, because you've got one dose in your arm you're protected. Uh, we know that the period of, um, of real protection uh, kicks in about two weeks after that first dose and it's absolutely crucial to have the second dose of Pfizer within three weeks and AstraZeneca within that four to six week period uh, following that. And just a question about the extra testing in Walga. Um, how, how does that exactly work? So this surveillance testing, is it just a matter of um, encouraging people to, you know, Go to, the, go to the testing places that are already in Walgett, but I guess they don't have to isolate, they can just go about their general business. Yeah, that's it. So, um, so surveillance testing is a much broader approach to help people come and get tested, um, even if they don't have symptoms. Um, and if people don't have symptoms or don't have close contact with someone with symptoms, then they don't need to isolate beyond that test. Now, that's a big step from where we've been with a lot of the um, testing across the whole of the region. It's particular to Walgett at the moment. It isn't expanded beyond that, uh, but intended to help people get tested, um, particularly if you're asymptomatic. Um, you haven't even got you know, some of the scratchy throat, um, the you know, headache, a uh, bit of a runny nose or an upset stomach. Um, those are the things absolutely, please come and get tested, don't delay. 
um, that even without those symptoms, it's okay to come and get tested and you don't need to isolate if you haven't been in contact with someone with symptoms. And sorry, just to hog the, hog the mic for an extra second, sure. um, are you wanting to expand that surveillance testing to other parts of the district, particularly to Dubbo, where a majority of the cases still are? No, we're certainly looking at it. Um, we, we know that uh, across the whole of the region with low testing numbers, um, we may be missing uh, people in the community with COVID. Uh, we know in the last 24 hours there has been people in the community infectious and so um, I really would say to everyone across the region, um, please come forward and get tested if you've got any signs and symptoms. It's just the most crucial thing at the moment for us to stop the spread. Great, thanks. Thanks, Gary. Claudia from Prime Orange. Thank you, Matt. Hi, Scott. Hi, Claudia. Um, just in regards to um, what you said before, in regards to um, 40,000 people who won't have their vaccination at a time we see COVID circulating more broadly, when is this sort of likely to happen? Are you talking right now currently or is this over the next sort of week or so? Well, let's uh, estimate based on, yeah, the whole of the state um, having restrictions eased uh, at 80%, and we know that there's some targets for both 70 and 80%. But what that means for our region is a potentially significant number of people that um, haven't been vaccinated. And the last thing we want to see is people picking up COVID in our community and getting really crook. And so the challenge isn't around 70 and 80% for me, it's, it's, it's everyone that needs a vaccine. Um, so please don't delay and hesitate uh, for a day. Um, this is the most urgent thing we can do. We've got the benefit of having the Australian Defence Force in our region for more time now, right through until the end of October, to help us all get vaccinated. So uh, the percentages are, are irrelevant for me. It's everyone in our community that needs a vaccine. Right. So just quickly confirming the 40,000 people that don't ha or won't have a dose of vaccine, is that currently or is that um, in the future? Oh, that would be an estimate at around 80% of the eligible population, the 40% of the an approximate number in our community that um, may not have a vaccination in their arms. Now, we're at 80% of first dose already. I believe we can get there with uh, second dose. Uh, and so the challenge is to um, get everyone vaccinated that can be vaccinated in our region. Thank you. And our, um, our vaccination rates are looking very strong across the region. Um, if people are set to get their dose within the next um, sort of month, we could be beating the sort of state overall. Do you mm -hmm. think um, we should be holding off um, before places like Sydney reach 80% or should we go to, um, to these restrictions earlier because our region has um, reached those milestones? Oh, so I think the most crucial thing is to get as many people vaccinated as possible. Regardless of those targets and the easing of any restrictions, the most precious thing is, is people's lives. We know COVID kills if you're not vaccinated. Um, it's got really severe impacts to people's lives and their outcomes longer term, not just short term, if you're not vaccinated. And so regardless of the percentages and the, the timeframes for easing restrictions, it's uh, human life that's, that's the most, pr most urgent thing for us to protect. Thank you. Thanks, Claudia. Riley from the Central Western Daily. Hey, uh, um, so just on a note about sort of lockdowns and the ending, that kind of thing. So on Facebook and, you know, social media, a lot of people are posting, you know, countdowns, you know, every day that places like Orange or Cabon, you know, don't get a case until that, you know, 14-day mark. I just wanted you to make it clear to, you know, to people, if there are no cases in an LGA after 14 days, is it a guarantee that that LGA will come out of lockdown? or not, and kind of, can you tell people why? Well, so now the, the 14 days is occupying everyone's mind at the moment. Um, yeah, we, we know that there's been people infectious in the community in Orange in the last um, six and 10 days. And so please, I don't want everyone to be complacent thinking that the 14 days is coming up soon. We're over the line anytime soon. We know that that assessment um, will be at the 14 day mark if there hasn't been an active case identified in that period, and that's the major decision point. Um, I think we all need to be really cognizant here that you know, COVID isn't going to pop its head up just to say I'm here and you can identify me now. It'll be creeping around any of our communities any day of the week. And so particularly for the community of Orange, we know that there's been people infectious in the community in the last six and 10 days. Um, there's been cases identified just recently that the most recent case was, um, was on the 11th of September. And so 
um, while the clock might be ticking on that any day of the week, um, we know that there's potentially people infectious in the community. Okay, so just one follow-up. So that's obviously a, a no, you know, it's not a hard and fast. If you make 14 days, you'll come out of lockdown, just because obviously people will you know, be a bit confused if it lasts, you know, a community lasts 14 days and then they're not out of lockdown, essentially. Well, I know that the, uh, the specialist team at the statewide level will do some of those assessments. I think, yeah, certainly, you know, testing rates, uh, serious detections uh, and some of the other surveillance things will you know, need to be taken into account you know, if we do see continuing declines in, in testing numbers and there's been people infectious in the community, then certainly that for me raises, uh, raises real concerns and, and worries. OK, yeah, that's all from me. Thanks, Riley. Sam from The Western Advocate. G'day, Scott. Um, I'm just following up on last week where you said one of the confirmed COVID-19 cases in Bathurst proved to be the most problematic for contact traces. Um, was there any any fallout from that? Was the person fined that you know of? I haven't got any details on the follow-up, um, but we know, you know every day that there's still um, some really difficult um, conversations with uh, with people that have you know, you know, found out that they've been uh, they've had uh, COVID confirmed. Um, but it honestly still behaving terribly towards some of our staff. Uh, the, the aggression and language that's being used is, is still really concerning. Um, the, the case in, in Bathurst was just one of many. Um, so can I please ask everyone, this is time for us to show some love and understanding and compassion um, that the, you know, being diagnosed with COVID we know is a scary thing to happen. Um, we want to support you and, and help through this. Um, but you know, we, we don't want to see you know, anger and aggression come out. It's not going to help us through this. Thank you. And in, in leading on from that, um, could you just remind everyone, you know, what the ramifications are for misreporting your whereabouts as a result of a positive COVID case? Yeah, sure. So uh, police um, are definitely taking action if there's uh, misinformation being provided um, that's leading us up a garden path, or the people saying they weren't out when they were, or um, likewise, and vice versa, then um, there's some you know, serious implications that, um, that there's fines and, and penalties um, around those things. Thank you very much. That's all for me. Thanks, Sam. Maggie from the Parks Phoenix. Thanks. Um, yes, I also just want to follow up on the 14 days because Parks has now had 14 days without a case. And I think, like you said, there's a lot of expectation in the community um, about whether we're going to go out of lockdown or not. But I'm just also wondering, um, because Parks is so close to Orange um, and there's a lot of people, I think, moving between the two for work and that other things, if that will be um, influence the decision for Parks. Uh, so I think we know that all of our communities are connected. People travel between communities for work, for you know, personal health reasons and, and other things. Um, so there's no doubt um, all of our communities have people travelling into them and out of them on a daily basis that could have COVID. So there's, there's risk there. Um, the things that we've done to keep each other safe are just crucial at the moment, um, particularly wearing of masks. Anyone outdoors, um, please maintain your mask wearing unless you're obviously exercising and, and doing the other things that are exempt from that. Um, the you know, situation in parks, we know that on the weekend there was a... There was a number of gatherings in parks where people travelled from Orange and other locations. Um, didn't do the right thing, but nonetheless, um, that, that's posed some real risk in uh, communities like parks. So I wouldn't rest on the laurels that uh, just for you know, 10 or 11 days there hasn't been a case identified. We know that any day of the week this can be some, some real risk. OK, thanks. And um, did, um, are those um, figures available today, um, like you said, about active cases? Uh, we're still doing a bit of work on that. Um, we know that uh, the um, reporting around that's uh, going to be important for us to understand that the number of recovered cases, I said, you know, grew by over 50 um, today. Those are the things that we're really focusing on, the number of people that have got COVID, that have uh, recovered or been discharged from our care in the community program. Uh, those are the things that I will come back with in a more um, regular weekly basis. Um, that the active cases uh, are a thing that are you know, measured at a statewide level after a period of 28 days. And so um, that the recovered cases is the thing that I'll come back with on a more regular basis for us. Okay, thank you.
Thanks, Maggie. Molly from ABC Central West. Hi. Uh, I was just wondering, um, sort of in reference to a question earlier, actually, but have we or do you think we could have reached the peak or possibly even surpassed it um, in terms of the number of new cases or is it possible that instead it's um, just cases are not being detected because those testing numbers are so low? No, Molly, I think a couple of things are happening. Uh, we know that in the last couple of weeks there was a lot of people infected with COVID in the households where there was someone isolating and the family was always going to um, going to pick up the infection uh, through that. And that's been uh, a lot of the cases in the last two, three, four weeks uh, from people with COVID in a household and infecting others. Um, we are still, however, seeing a number of cases every day still infectious in the community. It's a smaller number than uh, what we've seen in recent weeks. and. Um, with that has come uh, decreased testing numbers that I think is also meaning we're, we're missing um, people in the community that have got the infection that might be symptomatic. Going out doing their, their normal daily things, um, whatever daily is at the moment. Uh, but um, that, that's the most crucial thing for us at the moment is finding people that are out in the community um, unknowingly um, infecting others or picking it up from others. and so. Um, the most crucial thing we can do is go and get tested if you've got any signs and symptoms, however mild they might be. Any concerns as you've been in contact with someone, uh, those are the most crucial things for us. That's all for me, thank you. Thanks, Molly. And finally, Oliver from the Canamble Times. Thanks so much. Hi there. Uh, my first question surrounds the testing that's been going on in Walgett. Um, we heard that there's been some speed testing machines, I can't remember the actual mm. name for them, uh, that have been uh, up there to help with the growing numbers and getting on top of everything. I was wondering if you have any new updates about those in the regions. Yeah, sure. Um, it's uh, been pretty exciting to see all the new technology coming in that means we can get faster and faster turnarounds on the, uh, the COVID tests. So. Um, a machine was delivered to Walgett Hospital about a week or 10 days ago now called a LIAT machine. It's a machine that turns around a test in 20 to 25 minutes with a really high um, quality level for that test. Um, the Aboriginal Medical Service in, in uh, Walgett likewise has got what's called a GeneX machine and that's a, again a, um, a faster turnaround um, test than what we typically see. Um, those have been uh, delivered into both uh, into Burke as well. Um, both the Aboriginal Medical Service and the local hospital have got um, those machines in place as well. Um, this week we're seeing the delivery of a really exciting new device into Dubbo that, that can do up to around 2,000 tests a day with a really quick turnaround. Now what we've seen in uh, recent days in, in Dubbo um, with both the New South Wales Health Pathology, with Laverty and Histopath is a really quick turnaround. Um, under 24 hours for the vast majority of tests already and so um, we'll see that continue to improve in Dubbo. Um, likewise across Orange, Bathurst, Parks and other locations we're continuing to roll out uh, some of these fast turnaround um, devices. So um, popular, people really should have uh, confidence with that, that the um, waiting time for, to, for tests to be delivered back is much quicker than it's ever been. Um, we've got some really high quality uh, testing machines that are out there now delivering better results back as well. So please don't hesitate to come forward and get a test. If you've got any concerns, however mild, um, please um, come forward urgently. Fantastic to hear. And uh, my other question uh, surrounded the uh, test and isolate payments. I was just wondering, since they've now been available uh, across the region uh, as of today, do you think that's going to make a difference in the number of people that are going to be coming out and getting tested in future days and weeks? Well, I think people should have some confidence that uh, with, these, uh, with these payments there is some support in place. If you do need to isolate and you're, you're really struggling, then, um, then look out for that, that opportunity. As Dougal said, that information is now available across the, the whole of the region. Um, it's a good, exciting step. Um, we know that uh, there has been people um, holding back, coming forward and getting tested because of their work environments or for other reasons that they're just challenged in everyday life. And so. Um, hopefully this does make it a lot easier for people. Um, but please, everyone, don't hesitate. Come and, come and get a test. It's very easy. It's quick to turn around to get the result. And so I'd expect that, that, um, that those you know, two, three, four day waits that some people have had to experience definitely won't be anything like that into the future. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Scott. Thanks, Oliver. That's everyone. So we'll call it a day there. I'll get the recording out to you as quickly as possible. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.